All right. Going to welcome everybody to this live Facebook event with Experienced Workforce Initiative slash Asheville 50 Plus Works. Thank you guys so much for joining us. And if you're viewing this later on YouTube, thank you as well for watching. I'm Christina Israel, and I'm the Volunteer Services Specialist with the Council on Aging of Buncombe County. And I also serve on the uh, steering committee, I guess we call ourselves, for the Experience Workforce Initiative, which focuses on uh, job skills and training and professional development opportunities for folks over 50, specifically in the Asheville area of Western North Carolina. And uh, we host these bi-monthly, I guess, or quarterly uh, lunch and learns, and we used to do them live, but now we've transitioned over to doing Facebook live events and uh, still holding them in the lunchtime hour. So hopefully wherever you are, you're tucked into something good to eat. And uh, yeah, we're going to talk today about volunteerism and the ways that people can connect to service in their community, regardless of where they fall on the workforce continuum, whether you're still working or you have yet to enter the workforce or whether you are retired, there are volunteer opportunities uh, just so abundant in the Asheville area and in Buncombe County. And I'm really excited to welcome uh, a really great group of panelists. We have volunteer leaders and uh, some volunteers themselves as well joining us today from a variety of organizations across Buncombe County. So I'm going to go ahead and give these folks a chance to introduce themselves to you. And so we're going to start with Carrie. Hi. I'm Carrie Bergen, and I'm the volunteer manager with the Restores for Asheville Area Habitat for Humanity. And Habitat, our affiliate, that's the term we use, works to provide safe and affordable housing for the community of Buncombe County, greater Buncombe County, and we have a wonderful volunteer team and couldn't do it without them. Thank you, Carrie. And then we're gonna go to Carla. Hey everyone, my name's Carla. I'm the Director of Community Engagement with Bounty and Soul. Uh, we're a Black Mountain based nonprofit that connects, shares, and celebrates nutritious food and education. Um, we've got a myriad of different volunteer opportunities um, for, for all ages and abilities. So excited to explore that with y'all today. Thank you, Carla. Chelsea. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Chelsea Rath. I'm the Community Engagement Coordinator with Asheville Greenworks. I'm just going to share my screen for a quick moment and show you all a couple of the volunteer opportunities um, that we have that we work with in the community. Um, Asheville Greenworks was established in 1973. We're coming up on our 50th year anniversary here soon. Um, and our mission is to inspire, equip, and mobilize individuals and communities to take care of the places we love to live. We do that through a few main program areas and our volunteer opportunities um, are mostly focused in our urban environment. So again, the places we're living and um, exploring and adventuring with our families and friends. We work in urban forestry and water quality. These are just a few of our volunteer projects here, river cleanups, um, we have a native tree nursery. We also hold our hard to recycle events. And these are some of our largest volunteer efforts, but we hold volunteer opportunities all throughout the year with all kinds of groups in the community. And we love to connect with folks in that way. So. Looking forward to learning more about all the other people that are here today with us as well. Thank you. Great. And Alyssa. Hello, uh, My name is Alyssa Schumann. Uh, I go by Shu, and um, I am the volunteer manager at Mana Food Bank. I've been here since December and so far loving it. I'm new to the Asheville area as well. So it's been really great. And I love learning more about the other organizations too. Um, but uh, as you may know, MANA is a 501c3 and they are part of the Feeding America Network. And we are also an affiliate 
of that network. And uh, our mission is to involve, educate, and unite people in the work towards ending hunger. Um, and with with uh, the recent uh, pandemic, you know, that has become a major, major issue in our community. And we serve a wide um a wide range, uh, 16 counties uh, is who we serve. And so what we do would not be possible without our volunteers. They're so dedicated, they're so passionate and uh, we need help for sure to be able to get food out the door and to those who need it. So thank you. Welcome, welcome to Asheville, glad you're here. And Crystal. Well, hello everyone. My name is Crystal Taylor. I'm the Assistant Director of Troop Experience for Girl Scouts Carolina's Peaks to Piedmont Council. We serve 40 counties in Central and Western North Carolina, Buncombe County being one of them, in which our mission is to build girls of courage, confidence, and character who make the world a better place. So I have the privilege of helping connect your passion to our mission in which we have volunteer opportunities, whether you wanna be a troop leader, a cookie parent, I, or even you just wanna come in and do administrative work, help at our camp facilities or anything in between, uh, whatever your mission is, your skill set, we have a place for you here at Girl Scouts. Wonderful. And last but certainly, certainly not least, we have Gretchen and Kim who are our volunteers on this, on this panel. Well, hi, it's nice to see everybody and be on a panel with all these wonderful people. I'm already getting excited about opportunities to volunteer there. Um, I um, am a volunteer with AARP. I've been a volunteer for over 18 years, and I used to work for AARP. AARP was founded by one person, Ethel Percy Andrus, at her kitchen table. And um, one of her main focuses was on volunteerism. And um, now we have thousands of volunteers across the country. Kim, want to tell them some more about AARP and your role? Well, I'm also a community volunteer, not nearly as long as Gretchen, but I think people think of AARP as a magazine and a newsletter for people that are old. But we volunteer for the segment of AARP that goes out there and does great things for the community. Um, we're very involved in supporting uh, family caregivers. We are out there supporting uh, green spaces and livability in communities for people of all ages. We get involved in veterans issues. We definitely looking at diversity and anything really to make sure that all generations can come together. Uh, so you'll see AARP all over the place. Go ahead, Gretchen, and I'll share a screen on a, our volunteering page. Okay, I was just going to say one of my big loves that I've worked in for many years is fraud prevention education. And as I say, I'll never be out of a job. Um, oftentimes when you see volunteers, um, ARP volunteers, they have on red shirts. So uh, that just gets emphasized here. And I guess we'll hold the rest of their comments till we get further into the agenda. Thank you. Thank you both so much. We're so glad to have volunteers with us uh, here today as well. And I would certainly be remiss if I didn't mention my own organization, the Council on Aging of Buncombe County, where we rely very heavily on volunteers, same as all these other great places. Um, the mission of the Council on Aging is to promote the independence, dignity, and well-being of adults through service, education, and advocacy. And our volunteers participate in all of those um, areas of our mission, whether that's delivering food to homebound seniors throughout Buncombe County or supporting them with enrolling in SNAP or Medicare or the Affordable Care Act. Um, Council on Aging really does a lot uh, we're a huge uh, support for this community and connecting seniors to resources that they need to be able to age successfully wherever they are. So um, great. Well, I'm so glad that everyone's here. Um, I think we're going to launch into our discussion now. And um, I actually want to start with our volunteers. I want to start and hear from Gretchen and Kim and just talk about, you know, 
why you choose to volunteer. Gretchen, you said you've been volunteering um, for 18 years. You know, that's such a long time and it's such dedication. So you must be getting something out of it. You know, what, what drives that choice for you? Well, I used to work for AARP up in New England and then here in North Carolina. And so obviously um, I appreciate the work they do. Um, and what I really love is a volunteer a couple of things. We're, we're in the mountain region of North Carolina and our staff person is fabulous. She's so much fun to work with and she's so creative. So that makes it a joy. Another thing about ARP is um, you don't, you just don't have to do one thing. So I've worked on national teams. Um, I did driver safety programs, um, did a lot of work on women's issues and now doing home fit caregiving and primarily fraud prevention education. So I think it's the variety of things you can do and the creativity um, that you can bring to the job. So it's, it's fun. And Rebecca, our staff person is very open to uh, lots of ideas and working to help us make our jobs as meaningful as possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Rebecca is wonderful, and I love that you brought up um, your relationship with her because I think that's really good for uh, leaders of volunteers to hear. You know, a lot of times the experience that people have with an organization is the experience with its people that they have with its people. And you know, volunteer managers were like the front, the front line, and the go-between, and mm -hmm. um, that main touch point for volunteers. And so it's just really important our responsiveness and. Um, you know, dedication to our role. Um, volunteers pick up on that and it's really something that they value. Can we talk for a little while? Um, something that I, I think is really fascinating is uh, the ways that volunteering can benefit people socially, psychosocially, emotionally, their well being. There have been some great. Um, you know, research papers and studies that have come out in the last decade or so that point to, um, you know, the individual's quality of life really being benefited by being a volunteer, people living longer and having better health outcomes because they're out serving in the community. So I don't know if anyone wants to speak to that directly or, um, or indirectly, you know, provide maybe some, some thoughts or some examples of how you've seen that in your work. And I'll call well, on you I'll if go. I have to. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I'll go. Um, I moved to the Asheville area seven years ago and didn't know anyone in town, had just recently retired. So for a retired person, it's very difficult to connect with people. And also uh, when you retire, you have a sense of loss of identity and that can be a very difficult transition. So for me, and it was just by accident that I ran into Rebecca, who, like Gretchen said, having such a leader like her, it's impossible to not to want to stay volunteering. But now I'm connected. I've learned all sorts of new things about the senior community, about towns, um, how they create livable spaces. The variety of things that we get to choose from is amazing. And also, I can volunteer when I want and say no when I want and know that I have the complete support of our leader. And I've met great people like Mark, who used to volunteer with us and with Gretchen and other people. So I have a new friends and just sort of a feeling like I'm part of something. It, there's no doubt it makes a huge difference in your mental outlook every day when you know you've done something for the community and you've connected. I know later we're going to talk about uh, volunteering through the pandemic, but I will say definitely the social aspect for our volunteers. And then on another note, a place where, and I've been told this so many times, a place where our volunteers feel they can go where they have a little bit of a different identity. So just an example, we have a volunteer who's going through something non-COVID related medical with her husband. And she said, I love coming to Habitat to the ReStore because no one knows about his situation except you. 
So no one's asking me, how is so-and-so? What are you doing? How many medical appointments? She said, I can just be me. And, you know, we talked about how she felt selfish about that. It was just, it was a very eye-opening um, realization for her that that was kind of like a safe place where she could still be her and not a partner to someone sick. And I thought, wow, that's, that's a gift that I didn't even realize that, you know, until this, like I said, I've been told that before, but I was so excited we could give that gift to this person too. So. Yeah. Um, I totally feel you on that. Um, and I have definitely heard that echoed um, in our volunteer family kind of you know, having, having a place to show up and be dependent upon week to week, having this sense of purpose and connectedness to a cause that they're passionate about. Um, you know, we really try to get in the spirit at Bounty and Soul, um, as you'll, you'll see in my fun background here. Uh, we dress up in veggie costumes um, at our markets. Um, one of the ways that we kind of had to pivot during the pandemic um, is to distribute our foods in a, a drive-through capacity. So kind of like a, a CSA style food box um, versus the um, farmer's market atmosphere where families and individuals would, would self-select the foods that they went home with previously. And um, even though we're not able to physically gather with our community in spaces like we used to, we're really trying to still create that sense of community and connectedness, you know, the, the theme that we are all in this together. Um, and, and I think something that's really uh, exciting and, and representative of this organization is that there really um, is so much overlap between our volunteer family and our community um, that is seeking out healthy food support. So I think so much social, emotional connection um, We've all been craving that uh, while we've, you know, needed to, to stay uh, distanced for, for safety. And so uh, we have really strived to, to find that happy medium um, where people feel safe to volunteer during this time. And for many people, they've, you know, just mentioned that this has become a lifeline for them, that, um, that being able to show up and spend time at these various activities has been a real comfort. That's really beautiful. Go ahead, Chelsea. I just wanted to say, just kind of flipping it a little bit that I am so inspired by our volunteers. And I know that we all are in the way that they show up and how passionate they are about the work that they're doing. Um, you know, the vision that our community has for our future as a community um, is just really beautiful and inspiring that I learn just as much from them and get as much out of it as I hope that they do, um, you know, just, Having that sense of everybody working towards a goal and towards action um, is, is a really beautiful spot to be with our volunteers. Mm -hmm. Everything that was just said. <laughs> I, I mean, everybody put it so beautifully. Um, but yeah, I mean, it as a volunteer, um, you know, Kim, I resonate with you a lot too. I had moved to a new area and even as a young adult, like not knowing anybody and moving to a new area, golly, it's hard to find your sense of community. And, you know, I'm a very mission driven kind of person. And so volunteering was an, an easy choice for me. And I just had to find the right opportunity. And, you know, finding that community where you can, I think, I think all volunteers want to help in one way or another, whether it's helping the environment, helping other people, helping industries of some sort, you know, that, that really drives us, you know, to volunteer. And also the connection that we have with other people, whether it's the people you're serving with other volunteers or the staff, I think that is just overall like healthy um, and a wonderful way to live your life. And I encourage everybody regardless of where you volunteer to give back in some form or fashion um, because it feels good and it keeps you, keeps you young. And, you know, it, it's just like good for the soul. Um, so that, that's all I have to share. Hmm. 
So along those lines, um, I did ask you guys to to bring uh, maybe a story or a mission moment, some warm and fuzzies, you know, if you want to share something that um, that you've seen. I know that this has been uh, a tremendously challenging year and a half to work in volunteer administration. We've all had to pivot. You know, we hear that word a lot. Um, but at the same time, you know, with all of the changes that we've had to, um, you know, make in our programs and in the way that we deliver services, um, there, there are still mission moments happening every day. So um, who would like to share, share something like that with us? I'll share. Um, so pre-COVID in regular years, Asheville Greenworks works with around 3,000 volunteers annually. Um, we saw that number drop in 2020 to um, around 700 volunteers that were able to come to our organization. And a lot of that was pre-pandemic and a lot of that was um, volunteers just working on their own in the community, knowing that we weren't able to get volunteer groups together as safely as we were in the past to do some projects. And we had a lot of groups that came out and said that they still wanted to do projects and they would we told them where it needed to be done and what needed to be done. They would get their quarantine pod out there and they would um, do some projects. And we had a lot of the community show up in that way. Um, one program that we were able to create um, kind of right before COVID, but really took off with COVID was our tree keeper program. Um, and that is a group of volunteers that were interested in learning more. They wanted more training. They wanted just more um, education about the work that we were doing, what, you know, why are we doing what we're doing and how can they be even more involved. So we really invested in a smaller group of people that wanted to learn more and do more um, to give them a lot of education about tree care and tree maintenance, uh, specifically for our native tree nursery where we grow thousands of trees that are then given away to community members and planted in public spaces out in the community. Um, and as you can imagine, without those 3,000 volunteers, um, you know, those trees in that nursery need daily care, um, oftentimes, you know, certain seasons of the year. And so those tree keepers um, were really able to step up and be out there regularly when we couldn't get our, um, you know, school groups and church groups, the volunteers that we're used to having out there. Um, and now we're seeing, you know, the, the beautiful fruits of their labor, so to speak, because we've been um, getting back to our community tree giveaways. We have one coming up this month and, um, you know, we send home those trees with community uh, Buncombe County residents and they send us back pictures of their trees that they planted with their children. And they're like, we can't wait to watch this tree grow, you know, over the years as we're living here. So all these little pieces of the puzzle that really, um, you know, we couldn't have even predicted, you know, prior to COVID how we were going to get through. And so, you know, we couldn't have done it without the volunteers. I know we say that, but we truly couldn't have. Mm -hmm. What a great program. Um, oh, do you want to go, Kim? <laughs> Well, I was going to talk about a class that uh, Gretchen and I co-facilitate called Powerful Tools for Caregivers. And as we all know that during COVID, a lot of things change for our family caregivers out there. Number one, much more difficult or scary to bring in-home help. Worried about you know the health of both of our care receivers, a lot of them sort of frail and bringing in someone from the outside. And certainly everyone heard about some of the horrors going on in some of our nursing and skilled uh, help facilities. So people are staying home now. So what this means is that our caregivers are even more burdened than they would have been before COVID. So we had taught this class in person for a while, but being able to send it over to Zoom, and we're now just started our fourth uh, six week class, caregivers are able to attend from home. They don't have to travel. And after over six weeks, we're giving them all kinds of tools to help just relieve some of that stress that they're under all the time. So anyway, COVID has in a way made this uh, course blossom a little bit because we can get more caregivers and they have a lot more reasons to want to attend it. 
Um, what I was going to share, um, I just actually right before this webinar received kind of a, a warm and fuzzy text message from one of our volunteers um, who each Tuesday goes out to deliver what we're, um, we're calling benevolent boxes. And so um, these boxes go out to uh, families and individuals that either have a transportation barrier to our healthy food markets um, or a health condition um, that you know, create challenges for them uh, having this access um, to nourishing food. And so um, we create these boxes um, and, and put a little extra TLC if somebody is a diabetic, for example, um, to, to kind of cater this box with resources and food to support them. And then this volunteer goes to deliver it. So um, the text I got, um, you know, in summary was along the lines of, you know, this individual hadn't seen cherries, you know, since, you know, in years, and we're just over the moon because they're just so expensive at the store. And um, it's, you know, just that little thing that really connected them. Um, you know, she said she's grown up always having a passion for, for healthy cooking and eating, but, you know, since living on a fixed income and recently becoming handicapped, she just wasn't able to, to make ends meet. And so it just really, um, you know, reinforced um, why it is uh, we do what we do and how we're able to adapt to the needs of our community. So, you know, when people feel unsafe um, leaving their home right now that we're able to strategize um, and, and go back to the drawing board on, on how, can we, how can we meet these needs. Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah, a really um, tre tremendous amount of support is needed everywhere. Who is about to chime in? Is that Gretchen? Yeah, um, I, I was going to tell Carla, I'm so amazed to go to the grocery store and a cucumber costs 98 cents. Zucchini is a dollar ninety eight, and it's like used to be you couldn't give away your zucchinis. And, and anyway, um, about um, maybe three months after our beginning of this in March of twenty twenty, um, ARP totally uh, everything had to be it couldn't be anything in person. All staff are still working from home and so forth. But what we did with our fraud fraud issues is um, developed a webinar that I've done about 12 of on various topics where I interview or have a conversation with um, folks like if somebody from the Postal Service. It's amazing the kinds of fraud that go on in the in the postal system. Um, don't put checks out in your mailbox waiting for the postman, for example. Um, and banking, uh, cyber fraud, um, tax fraud, and all of that. So the switchover was was easy to do with the technology we have. And it's so much fun when people come up and say, oh, I got this call, and or I got this email, and you know, I, I knew it was a fraud. I didn't answer, and it's sort of like to know that people are getting help to protect themselves. So those, mm -hmm. are, those are the real payoffs. Yeah. Yeah, having to change the way that we do everything, you know, it's, it's challenging, but COVID has presented organizations with new opportunities to yeah. reach people and connect with people. Um, and yeah, even, even on the front lines of volunteer work or especially on the front lines of volunteer work, that's been the case. Um, I think that's kind of a good segue for us to kind of dive in. I want to hear from each of you about your individual programs and um, really use this time as a platform for you all to talk about um, what your biggest needs are right now for volunteers and also, you know, how are you ensuring that people are able to safely serve um, under the conditions that we're all in right now. Um, we haven't heard from Crystal yet. You want to talk to us for a while? <laughs> love to talk to you for a while. Yeah. Uh, so as you asked, um, I love the segue because where we found is a lot of our volunteers 
we've got a new batch of volunteers who've come through who want to volunteer with us virtually. And we have not had the opportunity to provide virtual opportunities, uh, but we were pushed into it because of the pandemic. So what we found is people from across the nation can be a mentor, a facilitator to any of our girls or adults, because now there is no bound, bound to geography getting to one of our offices, our meeting spaces, or our camps. Uh, so that's been great on the end for the volunteers, as well as our girls, that our volunteers now can provide opportunities, not to just the members who are in their back backyard, in their community, but we've been able to engage girls, not only across the US, but we've able, actually brought in three different countries and growing where girls from across the world are like, I love this wow. opportunity that your volunteers yeah. are providing virtually. And we want to connect, even if that means we have to be up at six o'clock in the morning to join your call or be out up at nine o'clock at night to connect with us virtually. So right now, our biggest need that we're looking for is finding more caring adults, supporting mentors for our girls and Girl Scouts. We're looking for you to support them on an ongoing basis by supporting a Girl Scout troop in your area, by bringing your skill set to the table. For instance, we have a Girl Scout troop that is a trailblazer troop where all they like to do is outdoors things. I had the privilege of hiking with them at one of our state parks for Girl Scout Love State Parks weekend. And they're just looking for other people who may have resources, the skill set to go with them when they're kayaking. They want to go and do a week long backpacking trip and they are looking for those to support them. Um, another area of support, don't worry, you're not outdoorsy, we got you covered because we also need some people just to be a friendly voice on the phone. Uh, we're starting our new membership year. We're wanting to call families and invite them back and let them know Girl Scouts hasn't stopped. We're still here. We're still here for the girls, for the families, and for our volunteers. And we just need some folks to come in on occasion or from their home and make phone calls to help sort packets, to mail to families. Um, but anything and everything in between, our program is so vast and robust that no matter what your skill set is, we have a place for you. Uh, but there's lots of girls who want to be in Girl Scout, and we are um, a volunteer-driven organization and girl-led, staff-supported. So we're looking for more volunteers to help drive our, our organization forward. Event planners are something strong we're looking for now. Uh, we're looking for people to help support some facility maintenance at our camp properties. And you asked the question, Christina, about how we keep folks safe. We still have a mask mandate when they're inside of our facility that everyone is still wearing masks. We have that a questionnaire when anyone enters our facilities for contact tracing to make sure that they have answered those preliminary questions about their wellness. And even when we're outdoors, we require masking for singing. And Girl Scouts, we sing a lot of great songs and we know singing is just projecting out there. But otherwise, if you're able to keep a three foot distance, we do um, let you take off your mask when we're doing outdoor activities. So that's um, how we're keeping everyone safe. We have these cute little um, hand sanitizer dispensers that you can clip on your waistband to clean your hands every moment that you so desire. Um, and we respect all of our volunteers. There are some of those who are not ready to be in person again. So we provided them all alternative ways to participate virtually, come pick up the materials, take them home and sort them, bring them back. Uh, so we're very accommodating based on your needs, your interests, and your passion and connecting that within Girl Scouts. Excellent. Great job. You guys are, you guys are on the ball, it sounds like, um, with some really great virtual opportunities and in-person who would like to talk about their program next and their biggest needs? I can go next. Um, so at Mana Food Bank, uh, our doors have never closed uh, since the start of the pandemic. We have kept food rolling out to the community and um, you know we've got several high need areas for volunteers. Um, and the main, way to get involved is through our warehouse and basically what we're doing there is sorting food packaging food and things like that we understand that's not for everybody but we do have some other opportunities as well um, for the warehouse we have monday through friday opportunities available and then on tuesday evenings as well uh, for those that maybe are in school or work during the day uh, and are looking for alternative times um, we have a nutrition program, so we're really um, diving in with that and trying to put assemble a team of volunteers that understand the world of nutrition um, and 
trying to make sure that we're not just putting food out into the community, but healthy food. You know, we want to make sure that there's fresh produce and vegetables and all that good stuff um, and not just um, processed foods and things like that. So we're working to uh, put together um, cooking demos and going out to the community uh, and showing people, you know, how to cook with an eggplant. Maybe you haven't seen one before or because uh, I haven't had an eggplant until I was in my 20s and let alone an avocado. So what do you do with those things? Um, so that's one way. Uh, we also have our food and nutrition services program. And so that is our helpline. And so people that are um, in need of food can call and we can provide them with several agencies that we partner with, their contact information and information about how they distribute the food to the community, um, and also helping with um, the SNAP application and just answering general questions like that, because that can be a really tricky process. And, um, you know, if you haven't been through that before, even if you have, it's still um, very time consuming and, and overwhelming. Um, we also have kind of everything between admin roles. Uh, we have volunteer drivers that help distribute the food and things like that as well. And as far as, um, you know, how we're continuing to go about in a safe manner, we have reduced our shift sizes pretty substantially by about 60, we're at about 60% capacity to where we were before the pandemic. Um, everyone is required to wear masks. We get our temperature checks as soon as people enter the building. Uh, we try and keep a safe distance between us, but you know, given the nature of the work, sometimes it's not always possible. Uh, but we do sanitize very, very often um, and remind everybody every chance we can, you know, those those safety uh, reminders. So I think that covers most of it. That's a lot. <laughs> That's great. Thank you so much. How about Carrie? You still there? Yeah, I am. Sorry. Sure. Um, so I, my focus, like I said, is with the restores. I know our biggest need. Um, Sorry, I don't know. What did anyone else? Hear? Oh, okay. Okay. Um, our, we have lots of volunteer opportunities at Habitat. Um, our biggest construction need would be in our home repair program. And there's a lot of information on our website. It's a wonderful program, very personal. You are in someone's home um, working on a repair and it's extremely rewarding. As far as the restore, we also offer lots and lots of opportunities and we're fortunate in that we have both two locations, one in Weaverville and one on Meadow Road in Asheville. And we also have lots of opportunities within the store, both public facing and not public facing. So I know we are fortunate with that. We, our biggest needs in the restores are our Weaverville location, which is a newer location. And so we, well, we were building our volunteer base until uh, March last year, um, but we're working to build it back. And also um, definitely Saturdays. And that would, that would be across the board because we always tell people, even if you can't commit to every Saturday, if you have maybe one a month or every other Saturday, um, it's one of our busiest days. Tuesdays and Saturdays are our busiest days. And so um, we can offer lots of different opportunities from, like I said, public facing register support, working the floor, processing, donation receiving, and then lots of behind the scenes work as well. Um, as far as the safety aspects during the pandemic, safety was always a big focus beforehand throughout our programs. Throughout the pandemic, of course, like everybody else, we sat down and thought a lot about how we were gonna proceed because the Restore supports the organization financially such that we couldn't stay closed and we had staff to pay as well. So. We closed on Mondays and we are proceeding with that going forward um, at least until July. And that was great because we brought volunteers back on those work days and were able to offer, this is just for you. This is just a space for you. And so I set up two shifts and did a lot of social distancing, especially in the beginning, cap numbers, that kind of thing. We did temperature checks, of course, masks have been nonstop. 
um, the whole time. And we're currently still requiring masks no matter where you are in the building, um, unless you're outside on a break, of course. And we have lots and lots of cleaning products scattered everywhere, every area is fully stocked. Um, and I check in with the volunteers pretty frequently because as we're starting to bring back new volunteers or our core volunteers who are feeling comfortable being there, and then of course new volunteers too, want to make sure people are still feeling comfortable as we are not doing temperature checks anymore. So I wanted to check with people about how they felt about that. So every time we've changed one of our protocols, we've checked first and then checked along the way. And I think that has really, we've been, we've been safe. I mean, our, our results are proven by our wonderful team of staff volunteers throughout the whole time that, that we, we, didn't have outbreaks. So I'm really proud of that too. So, but please contact either me, I'm sure my information will be distributed, or you can also go to ashevillehabitat.org to sign up and we would love to have you. Mm -hmm. I think that's really helpful for people to hear. I know it's helpful for me to hear. I, I feel a little despairing sometimes about in-person opportunities because um, people are, you know, their right to be as cautious as they're being, especially depending on their individual health um, situation. Um, that being said, you know, following the proper protocols, the protocols seem to work really well as far as masking and distancing and hand washing. Um, and so we can safely volunteer in person and work in person. We just have to be smart about it and be careful. Um, but I really appreciate you going into that level of detail. Chelsea, you want to jump in? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, also, that was me who accidentally stopped the recording. I was trying to hit chat and I hit pause or something. So. I oh, know. okay. Cool. <laughs> um, but Asheville Greenworks, um, we're a little bit different. We're lucky because we work in the urban environment, so our volunteer opportunities are outdoors anyway. Um, we do have some volunteers that work like in our administrative um, role and provide support there, but um, Greenworks really kind of works systematically to approach issues in our community and we respond based on whatever the current needs are in the community um, because we are really just a, a public serving environmental organization, but we work in our urban environment, so it's the places where people are working and living, um, we really, you know, a lot of the times rely on our community to come to us and, um, you know, or just tell us what they're needing. So we have a lot of people in the community that come to us for projects. So um, right now we're focusing on a lot of, um, we're focusing on some flood cleanup from Fred still. Um, we've been partnering with um, the community or the county um, to, to do some flood cleanup. Um, we also had a, um, a community member from the Broad River community reach out to us about a 40 year illegal dump site that they have in their neighborhood that they are, um, you know, is becoming an issue and a hazard. And so um, those are some ways that Greenworks is able to kind of respond to those community needs um, and pull together volunteers and pull together support. So our needs really change pretty often depending on, um, you know, what's going out in our going on in our community. Um, but then we do have our more regular opportunities like with our hard to recycle events are always a big need for us. Um, those are recycling events we do six times a year throughout the county um, as a service and people can bring their items to be recycled that they can't put in their curbside bin. Um, and with a small staff, we really can't run those events without um, volunteers. So that's always a big need for us kind of ongoing. Um, and then again, in our tree nursery is um, we have weekly work days out there. We do have work days during the week and on weekends. So to hopefully, you know, accommodate people's schedules. Um, but those, those trees uh, do need care and they need to be repotted when they grow and they need to be watered and um, so they, they can stay beautiful. And I think that our, our trees out there have never looked better than they have in this past year with um, those tree keepers that I mentioned who are really 
doing a lot to support that. Um, we have a tree giveaway coming up on Halloween. Um, so we're doing a lot of work to prepare for that right now to get ready for that giveaway. Um, people can go to our website and find our upcoming events page to look for current opportunities, but they can also reach out to volunteer at AshevilleGreenworks.org um, if they wanna learn more about a project or if you have a school group or um, a group of friends or you know, you're know you a larger group and you wanna have something set up, a project for your group, that is another way that we also work with volunteers. That's great. Group projects are harder to find than you think. Mm -hmm. um, so that's really nice to, to know that we can point people to Asheville Greenworks for those. What about for AARP, uh, ladies? What are some of the bigger, as far as you know, some of the bigger needs for AARP volunteers right now? Well, as I suggested, AARP is pretty much volunteer driven. Um, and there's opportunities in a variety of programs and in a variety of levels. For example, everybody doesn't want to go out and give presentations, but um, when we're in person and doing events, we need people to help check people in and pass out materials or work at a booth at a health fair or some other kind of um, opportunity. Um, and then um, obviously with in-person things, um, basically I guess it's people that feel comfortable talking, but we've got programs in brain health, you know, how to make your brain as healthy as possible. Um, Kim said about caregiving, and I talked about fraud. Um, uh, the livable communities, Kim has done some real neat work. Um, I hope you'll tell people about Kim um, with urban projects, um, I, what am I forgetting, caregiving, and then public policy. And in public policy, um, one of the, you can, all of us need to write to our senators and so forth. And um, usually ARP gives you a, a, a kind of a idea of what you might wanna say. Letters to the editor um, are really important. Um, being on radio shows or even television. Kim, what am I missing? And maybe you can put up the info about Rebecca um, uh, as a person to contact to uh, volunteer. Well, um, you, you mentioned advocacy, but I think it's important to uh, make sure that everyone knows how much AARP puts into supporting things like on the federal level, things we all care about, that social security and uh, Medicare and then on state levels, we get involved in projects like work and save. So employers of small businesses can make sure that their employees can save dollars for their future retirement. And also tax write-offs for caregivers. Family caregivers are the most underpaid group around. The CARE Act, making sure that if you are the person that's supporting someone in the hospital, that you also get trained by hospital staff on how to take care of that person at home. And then, like Gretchen mentioned, on the local level, we do cool things like street tweaks. So if anyone remembers over on Cox Avenue, all the butterflies that were painted there, that was like a one-year experiment to show how a, a downtown area can be opened up for people of all ages, more areas to cycle, to, to walk, and to gather. We also did a temporary roundabout off of um, Haywood Street at... Um, Waynesville and Westwood. And that's a temporary circle to slow down traffic again to allow pedestrians and cyclists to get through. So we have all kinds of cool things. I don't have Rebecca's information up, but I'm gonna share the screen with one thing here. And that is an upcoming event uh, where we're gonna get involved in having hundreds of people online talking about growing our communities with grace connecting a broadband issue. So we've brought city managers from cities all over Appalachia to talk about this, talking about affordable and accessible housing. And we get involved in transportation solutions. Uh, how do we get our people moved around in our mountain areas where it's hilly? So that's just some other things. Yeah, and there's, a, let's see, Tennessee, Virginia, who all is involved? What states are involved? There's several states involved with that. Yeah, Virginia, Tennessee, and North Carolina. 
Right, right. Ellen, it's important we didn't say this, but AARP is a nonpartisan organization, so we work on issues, but we never support candidates or participate in any PACs or anything like that, so we're nonpartisan. Great. That's all wonderful. I'm, I'm attending some of those sessions um, myself in the Livable Appalachia Summit. I'm really excited about it. I think that, um, you know, I work in aging services now, and um, so maybe I'm a little more attuned to caring about things like that. But, you know, at the end of the day, we're all aging in place, no matter where we are. <laughs> and so um, focusing on livable communities and making our world the way that it would be nice if it could be, uh, you know, and ha having access to, you know, more affordable housing and transportation and things like that. Those are things that whether or not they impact us directly, we should all care about, I think. Um, I think I, I think we touched on every, on everyone's programs, didn't we? We did. Um, I, think, I do. I think to... I've got to go still if there's just a quick minute. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, so yeah, Bounty and Soul, we we witnessed you know unprecedented growth in the last year and a half, um, and and so much of what we do is made possible um, by partners like Mana Food Bank. We're an agency partner of Mana. Um, we really had to strategize to to source. Um, more produce than we ever have. So working with store level partners um, and local growers, um, our, our volunteers really helped us to, to meet that, that demand. Um, we recently created uh, a new space uh, where our, it's, it's our new volunteer hub where all of our, our sorting sessions and the box prep, um, all of that curating takes place there in a, a designated space that is spacious, allows us to social distance, that um, is a, a nice central place uh, for our operation. Our, our healthy food markets are all held uh, in outdoor spaces. Um, so I think that that has also worked to our benefit um, currently as we kind of operate in this abbreviated capacity. Um, but, you know, truly there are so many different facets of our work. So, you know, if you're passionate uh, about cooking and nutrition, there are ways to nurture that, um, you know, by assisting with cooking demonstrations or spearheading a, a health and wellness lesson or uh, spending time in a market role that, that allows you to connect with our participants about food and nutrition. Um, if you're excited to, to get your hands dirty and dig in with one of our, our local garden or farm partners, we're doing a lot more uh, on the harvesting side of things um, and, and kind of really putting the care and intention into spotlighting the local growers that support us. So um, we have some local foods uh, shifts that take place um, at the office where we're adding healthy recipes or nutrition tips, ways to use sweet potato greens or kale or uh, different seasonal vegetables that come through. Um, and for those of you that are, are still uh, wanting to support nonprofits in a remote capacity, um, one thing that we've done uh, throughout the pandemic that's been really fun is um, creating handwritten love notes. Um, so these are little, little notes of encouragement created by community groups and individuals to just kind of put a message of positivity out there that, that somebody is thinking of you. And um, so if, um, you know, you're looking for a creative outlet or a, a remote project for a school group or a church group, this could be a really beautiful way to um, extend that, that care and connectedness um, in that way. Um, we have also, um, just in the last few years, really expanded our outreach to our native Spanish speaking communities. And so uh, we're always seeking bilingual support um, to connect uh, authentically with the families and individuals that prefer to speak Spanish as a first language. Um, so I would definitely steer anyone, um, you know, that's looking to learn more about these opportunities and more to the get involved section of our website, um, sign up for our monthly newsletter. Uh, we are uh, always finding new ways to engage our community. 
That's fantastic. Thanks. I love how you have, um, you've, you've brought up creativity and actually several of you have brought up creativity as um, like volunteerism and volunteering can be an outlet for one's creativity, whether it's making those beautiful notes, which um, I saw an example of that on Bounty and Souls uh, website and was just like blown away with how lovely um, the note was. And that's another thing that I think bears mentioning for people is, um, you know, if you're watching this, uh, this video and you're like, you know, really, you really feel connected with, you know, one of the organizations that someone has presented on, but you didn't hear specifically like, oh, that sounds like the opportunity for me. Um, I know I speak for probably everyone when I say that, you know, we get that. And what we really want is people who want to volunteer, who feel connected with the mission and then, you know, come on board and we will help figure something out. Or if you have this idea that, you know, you think would be great for the organization as a volunteer, tell us. And, you know, usually um, we make something work and some really great volunteer initiatives are born that way because someone from the community brings us this idea and it just like blossoms into this gorgeous, you know, impactful thing. Um, so sorry, sorry about that, Carla. When I when I tried when I accidentally almost skipped over you earlier, scrolling through these Zoom faces. Um, this has been wonderful. We're we're almost uh, in the the one o'clock um, time frame, almost there. I do want to mention um, Council on Aging of Buncombe County. We have. Um, a great, our greatest needs right now are for people who are insured at uh, the 100,000, 300,000 liability level. That's our requirement to um, drive for us to do a, a number of different sorts of food delivery. We have uh, hot meals that need to be de delivered to seniors, bags of groceries that are delivered twice a month, boxes of food that are delivered once a month. And um, we, we have long lists of people who need this support and it's really important um, for people to eat. You know, we have two uh, wonderful food partner organizations on this, uh, on this video as well. And so food security is a big deal um, as is environmental health and, you know, the upbringing of strong, wonderful women. <laughs> um, we just, Food, like food security and the lack of transportation are the two big things that um, that Council on Aging volunteer, we need volunteer support with. So if that's something that you're interested in, my mission moment that I could have thrown out earlier that I didn't, um, I was interviewing a new volunteer the other day and he was really connected to wanting to deliver um, for the food programs. And then we got to the interview and he didn't have the appropriate level of insurance. And I it was just I was disappointed because I knew that he would just he would be disappointed. I emailed him and I'm like, I'm so sorry. And he called me immediately and was like, you know what? I just figured I would reach out to my insurance company and check and see how much it would be for me to have to, to like increase my liability policy. And he was like, it was such a small amount of money. It's not a big deal to me. I really want to do this. And no one had ever done that before. So um, if that if if you're connected to the idea of wanting to drive and deliver to homebound people, um, but you don't carry that amount of liability insurance, just, you know, as an example, it, it might not be that much to add it to your policy. So um, that was really helpful for, for him to share that with me. So I figured I would share it with all of you. The way to find out about all of these great organizations and the work that they're doing is um, obviously to look them up on the internet. Um, and I'm sure that most of you are also on Volunteer Match. Um, we get a lot of referrals from volunteermatch.org. And um, if you're in the in anywhere in the country and you're looking to, or they might even be worldwide now, I don't know, but if you're anywhere looking for volunteer opportunities, you can type in your city and state or your zip code and you'll receive a list of opportunities um, that are nearby. And then you can start you know, picking and selecting. But um, if you have any direct questions for anyone who's on this uh, on this video today, then go ahead and reach out to their organization. They're all amazing. They're going to get in touch with you with, with whatever you want to know. Um, so yeah, I think we're going to wrap this thing up unless anyone, does anyone have anything else to add or any parting words of wisdom that they'd like to share? Uh, 
All right. Well, it's wonderful to see your smiling faces and to, um, yeah, hopefully help some folks out in, out in the community connect with service opportunities. Um, we're so grateful for you for you checking out this uh, Facebook Live event today. Thanks for, thanks for joining us and everybody have a great day. Adios. Thank you.